working hours, the best thing to do is never schedule anything before 11 a.m. Eastern time in the morning. Um, second, you'll need to pick your platform. So at Urban, we use Zoom meeting and webinar, which is what we're on right now, which is similar to Teams, WebEx, and GoToMeeting. Chances are you've probably worked on one or more of these platforms during the pandemic. Um, this may not work best for your audience and other options could include doing like a Facebook Live, using YouTube or any other social media platform that you are more comfortable with and that you know your audience uses. And then lastly, create your team. So at Urban, we have a team of four people, soon to be five. Um, and we don't necessarily have every person on each event, but we have one person who serves as a lead planner. And this person project manages the event planning process, executes a live event in the producer role, and helps manage the content lead. Um, we also have an event support and backup who can jump in and execute the planning of a live event should the lead planner have an emergency, such as getting COVID or even having an internet outage. Um, we have we recommend that we have a person that you have a person who takes the lead on event content, and they are the ones who draft the invitation copy, brainstorm the speakers, reach out to speakers, draft the discussion guide, and manage things like interview questions and things like that. And then lastly, it's important to have tech support on hand to help mitigate any tech disasters. Um, if you're a super small team, which many of you may be, you'll always want at least two people on an event, someone who can serve as the lead, someone who can serve in the content role, and then the person in the content role can back the lead up on the day of the event, just making sure you've got two good internet connections tethered so that you don't drop out in the middle of a webinar. Next up is building your event. So once you've picked your platform, selected a date and time, you need to start building your event. The first step is identifying and inviting your speakers. So start with brainstorming the perspectives you're gonna to want to include, and then create a short list of speakers that you think could speak to each perspective. Once you've created that list, look at your potential speakers. Do they represent diverse backgrounds and ideas? Will they engage your audience? Will your audience see themselves in the speakers? Consider all of these questions and then refine your speaker ideas accordingly. Once you have that refined shortlist, invite your speakers. Be sure to send a calendar invitation to hold the date and time for the event and attach any pre-event pre prep needed along with any relevant links so everything is in one place for your speakers. Next, you're going to want to draft your invitation copy. With your speakers confirmed, draft a short four to five sentence invitation that will tell your audience what the event is about, what you hope they will get out of coming to the event, who is speaking, how to register, and where to go with questions. Try to keep this as short and as sweet as possible, using plain language and keeping hyperlinks to a minimum so people are mostly clicking that register here button. Um, you'll want to set up your registration, and at Urban, we use registration forms as a way to gather more information about who our most engaged audience is. We ask for first and last name, job title, organization, as well as location, state, and zip code to help us learn where our most engaged audience members live and work. We also always include language about accessibility. So we include a line that says, we strive to host inclusive, accessible events that enable all individuals, including individuals with disabilities, to engage fully. Please email events at urban.org if you require any accommodations or have any questions about this event. This will help surface additional needs and make sure that your event is meeting the needs of your audience. Um, and also, as you know, we're using here today, we're using Spanish language translation. If you're using Zoom or Teams, there should be an option with paid accounts to use live captioning. These are AI auto-generated captions, but they can help nonetheless. Um, and then Lastly, as you're building your event, you're going to draft a run of show. This document is used to craft the agenda for the event and give every person involved in the planning side the exact information about what will happen and when. The run of show should include who's logging on to start the event and the account the event is on, when the speakers are logging on and any technical direction the speakers require, technical or AV cues as, such as when to start start the webinar, start recording, who is speaking, how long they are speaking for, and whether that person has slides, and then who is responsible for things like moving people to breakout rooms, keeping time and making decisions about timing if things go off schedule, 
who is packing up the event lead and who is the responsible for handling any tech questions or audience Q&A. Um, this should be shared internally and can be used to then inform the public agenda. And um, we created a run of show for this meeting and we'll share that as a template for you if you're interested in seeing how we do things here at Urban. So once you've built the event out, you need to promote your event. So it's important to get your audience signed up. So you'll take your invitation copy and put it into a direct email, an email marketing system, a newsletter, or any other tool that you use to share with your audience. Ideally, this happens about four weeks before the event, at least at Urban, that's our goal. Um, it doesn't always go that way, but that'll give you plenty of time to get people signed up and registered and give you opportunities to send follow-up emails without spamming people too much. So we generally recommend sending the invitation about once per week with a tune in today message the day of the event to remind folks that it's happening. If you're using a Zoom webinar or WebEx or something like that, those platforms also have reminder emails. So you'll just wanna make sure you coordinate with those so you're not double dosing people with, don't forget this event is happening today in one hour in 24 hours, things like that. Um, be sure to share the invitation that you share with the public, with your speakers, and ask the content leads to share that with their audiences. Um, and if you have a strong social media presence using platforms like Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and even TikTok, can help drive traffic to your event. Next up is preparing for your event. So preparation is key. We were talking about this before you all signed on, but in the virtual world, I think a lot of people wait until just the moment that their computer tells them that they're going to a meeting um, and show up and may not be the most prepared. Um, so we at Urban have found that having a couple of dedicated times for people to think about their event and their participation in an event really helps make things run smoother. Um, so we include two things. First, a prep call with speakers in advance of the event to review the goal and the discussion questions. This usually gives everyone the opportunity to sort of talk a little bit about what they're gonna say and make sure that not every person is saying the same exact thing and that different perspectives are being represented. Second, we do a pre-event prep period, usually the 30 minutes directly before the event, which will give speakers the opportunity to test their audio, test their video, make sure their tech is working, and ask any remaining questions. In addition to these prep periods, we request slides and videos in advance, so you can we can download and test them. And then, especially if this is your first virtual event, doing an internal test run with yourself and your staff members, making sure you're comfortable starting the webinar, managing things like chat and Q&A. If you're trying new things like spotlighting or breakouts, it's important to practice with your colleagues to make sure that that runs as smooth as possible um, on the day of the event. And then lastly, once you are all prepared, you host the event. So we recommend that the main host log on and test your setup about an hour in advance. If you can, plug into Ethernet to make sure your connection is secured. As each speaker comes on, test each speaker's audio and video. Use a separate computer like I'm doing today to share your slides. Make sure that computer doesn't have things like Slack, Teams, Outlook, um, and all that kind of stuff up so you're not getting pop-ups on your screen. Um, you'll want to check the settings for chat, raise hands, Q&A, accessibility options, make sure they're, they're set at what you would like them to be set at. And then if you're trying to record, make sure that automatic recording is on, and then you start the webinar. Once the webinar is started, your speakers will hopefully be able to deliver their message to the audience. And on the back end, you just make sure that you're there to answer any questions, make sure you're monitoring chat and Q&A, you're advancing slides, be ready to solve any uh, tech issues on the fly, and when the conversation is over, make sure to close the event quickly so that no one has a hot mic situation. And then once you've done that, you've completed successfully hosting your event. Um, and this wraps up my presentation. I hope it was helpful. And I look forward to answering your questions about planning after the panel conversation. Thanks so much, Alana. And full disclosure, um, we did not do a handful of those for today. Um, and so we will be building them into um, 
our future events. So thanks so much. Um, right now, I am going to um, we're going to uh, get started on our uh, on our uh, discussion panel here with some of our P four VE members. Um, I have added them to the spotlights, and so let's start out. Um, give me one second. Okay. So to start out, um, let's go with our first question. Um, so over the past two years, um, what are some of your lessons learned for planning and running virtual events? We could start with Adjua. Absolutely, and I apologize if you hear a lawnmower. They just wanted to start landscaping. Um, but I would say some of our lessons learned, or in my one favorite in particular, would be how important excuse me, how important pre-production meetings are. I think sometimes people underestimate the value of a good run through um, and just sitting down with your team and going through every single part of the event. So from start to finish, also making sure that all your materials and guests are prepared. I think those are some of the most important things and some of the biggest lessons that I've learned. Also, as well as being able to be ready to pivot and to be flexible. Um, I think like Alana said, sometimes, you know, the internet things can happen, right? So just being ready, um, maybe someone doesn't show up on time, someone has the wrong link, someone has the wrong slide deck, it's okay, it's not the end of the world, um, but being, be, just being able to be ready to pivot from those things. Perfect, uh, Darshana, do you wanna go ahead, same question, past two years, main things you've learned. Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd echo a lot of what's already been said from Alana and Ajwa, um, but I think to add to that, um, doing the most you can really to make sure that you're understanding your audience, and, and Alana already kind of talked about this a little bit, but making sure that the content is really going to be tailored for whoever is going to be on the training. So um, you had given the example of on the registration um, website, you would ask questions for people um, to give you a little bit more insight on where they are um, or how much experience they have on the topic that's going to be discussed. Um, all of that information is really, really useful um, for you to tailor all of the content, for you to you know, give more specific guidance and parameters to the speakers that you're going to engage so that they are going to touch on um, the right information for the speakers that are going to attend. So I, I feel like that's one of the biggest things. Um, and there, there are a lot of ways you can do that too. Like if you have um, resources to send out a survey beforehand, if you know who's going to be in attendance, that's also really helpful. Um, but I think that's one of the biggest things is just making sure that your speakers know who the audience is going to be, making sure to, to really brief them on that um, so they feel confident on who they're speaking to. Absolutely. Um, I just, I mean, it, it, it often, a lot of our events, it kind of works out really well since we have our built-in community here and we're able to, I mean, I think a lot of our events, we draw on our own um, expertise from within the community. And so we're all talking to each other about it. And I think that, that actually helps working out really well. Um, and then thinking about a virtual event that went well, so like in the past, so like what pre-work or pre-event work like helped ensure that that happened. We'll start with Darshana this time. Yeah, yeah, I can jump in. Um, I would say something, an exercise that I like to take myself through is, you know, usually we'll have some type of like larger, broader topic in mind um, of wanting to do a training. And then I'll kind of take that and on a document work through what are those key objectives that I really want attendees to take away from this training? So that's, you know, that'll be informed by what I know of my audience and, and what they need and um, any other information that I might have. But taking myself through that exercise really gets me in a good headspace and knowing this is what the agenda should look like. Here's the guidance that I should be giving to any internal speakers for my organization, but then any external speakers that I'm gonna engage. Um, and, and that has always been really helpful in the pre-work um, so that I can, I can make sure that it's gonna be focused and attendees are gonna get what they need out of it. Um, so that's been really helpful for me. And then Ajwa, 
and you already touched on this a little bit, but. Yeah, absolutely. Um, when I think back to one of our most successful events, we partnered with another organization. And I think some of the pre-work that went well in that was understanding, I think Darshana and Alana spoke to this as well, but understanding the audience and understanding the information we were giving to the audience. So we knew that it was very practical, it was very insightful information. And we wanted to make sure that as many people as possible would be there to hear it. And so encouraging our partners and our members to share it with their networks and their members as well, that was able to increase our attendance for that event, probably to the most, the largest one that we've ever had. Um, and by doing that, we were able to spread such insightful and practical information. So I think, um, like Alana mentioned in, you know, the pre-work for that event, sending it out, not too much, but just enough, um, making sure that everyone is telling everyone is telling everyone about the event. And that is something that made that event very successful. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually gonna build off of that. Um, because I, I think that an event actually that I worked on with Darshana actually was one of the best that we've ever done um, where we had, and I think that that aspect, I, with they had P, we had PGP sending out um, promotional information and we had our own within the community. And I think we were able to, to really like, get it out far and wide. Um, I think for that particular event, that was very, very well attended um, as far as our social media series. If uh, you want to check it out, it's on the website, just as a nice little plug there. Um, so there's lots of different options for hosting virtual events. Um, can you talk about which platform your organization uses um, and why? I can go ahead. So as an organization, we prefer to use Zoom and not necessarily Zoom webinar, but Zoom meeting. So um, I think sometimes on Zoom webinar, the participants, they do not have the opportunity to be as engaged as one would like, right? They're very limited in what they can do um, and what they can say. Our group and our audience, they like to be very interactive. And I think that goes into also knowing your audience and know who you're speaking to. So they like to be very interactive. They like to see each other. Um, obviously you have to do your work on the back end, making sure that is controlled in a way, but I think it is very benefic beneficial um, having our participants being able to interact with each other, interact with us. If they have questions, they can ask them as opposed to just typing them in the webinar or in the chat portion, excuse me. Um, and that that turns up make, having it being a really successful people have the opportunity to share on things that they're doing and everyone likes hearing from each other so that's why we particularly stick to the zoom meeting as opposed to the zoom webinar got it i mean i know that we weigh that like this is happens to be a zoom meeting through zoom webinar <laughs> but um darshana do you want to uh, go ahead yeah, um, I, I agree with all the points that Ajwa just made. Um, we also use Zoom um, for a lot of our, our trainings. Um, it depends on the type of training, whether we use Zoom webinar, Zoom meeting. I think for a smaller, more intimate conversation, we definitely go the Zoom meeting route. Um, but for more, that's more, it's gonna be more of like a, a longer presentation in the upfront of the hour. Um, we do like a webinar format where people would be muted um, and then allowing them to unmute themselves later on during like the Q&A portion. Um, so that's what we use. I, I have used um, WebEx events before. Um, I know that platform has maybe been, you know, more updated in the last couple of years, but um, WebEx is also uh, a platform that's available to people. Um, and then I think Google also has some, some platforms too, but the, I think the one important thing that I wanted to call out there was that um, if there are organizations holding trainings and, and if you know that there are going to be attendees that have um, government emails are going to be um, attending from, from the government, um, I know that there is a Zoom for government uh, uh, platform out there that um, is like an acceptable application um, for the government to use. So that could also be something to consider because I know sometimes there are issues using just the regular Zoom version um, if you have government folks on the call. Perfect. Um, and then I know from our own perspective, we, use, we do use Zoom webinar and Zoom meetings. I mean, what, for us, one of the biggest differentiators between the two is the size of our anticipated audience. I know for 
Um, we've been doing a series of workshops recently, workshops, trainings, more interactive events. And for those, we feel that, um, like Ajwa was saying, that a meeting is more personal. Um, people are allowed to speak, or not allowed to speak, but it's much easier for audience members to unmute themselves and speak if they want to ask questions. Um, but for the larger um, events, having the Q&A option um, in the bottom, we found has been, especially for the person managing the chat and looking out for Q&A, um, I found that that is a, a really beneficial feature. Um, it, for the larger events, because sometimes it's hard to keep track of chat, things get lost in there, especially when you have 100, 100 plus, 200 people. Um, I did see a question pop up in my own chat, which are how are registration links um, created to have invitees register? And that is a feature within Zoom webinar that you can set up beforehand. And so you can uh, set up a few questions, ask, um, I know for ours, we ask like, are you a P4VE member? Are you funded? Um, we get your organization name and that way um, it's a useful feature for reporting metrics if you need to um, on any of your events. And then so what are some things that haven't worked out um, quite well um, or as well as possible for some of the virtual events that you've that you all have managed? We could start with Darshana here. Sure. Oh man. Um, <laughs> a lot of those items I feel like are like tech related usually. Um, I think we talked about it before a little bit, but that like pre-practice run through is so critical um, because you try to, you know, go through all the motions of actually starting the webinar, getting the recording right, getting the interpreter in the right room, making sure the speakers have the right access. Like there's a lot of things that need to happen in the first like five minutes um, that could go really wrong um, if you don't practice those things. Um, so tech is, is one of the pieces um, that's always kind of a toss up, but I feel like if you practice it with your team um, and with the speakers, then you're setting yourself up for success when you're actually doing the event. Um, in terms of other things that haven't worked well, um, I'd say that there, there was a training one time that we had brought in three other organizations to speak on a one hour training and they were allotted about 10 minutes for their presentation and we were running a little bit behind. Um, so it kind of caused us to have to shorten people and cut people off a little bit because we were trying to be mindful of staying within the hour. Um, so I think the learning from that was really thinking through like within the time frame that you have how many speakers that you feel like would be feasible to have on the call and and giving them the the appropriate time to really be able to tell their story and their experience um, instead of trying to fit in so many um, I think that that was the biggest takeaway from that training yeah I think Dashani you made a great point about um time um because how do you cut someone off in a nice way right so <laughs> I think that's something that we definitely all go through um people people like to share they like to talk and you want to make sure that everyone has enough time to do that so that's something that can be a bit tough but I would say for us one thing that I have found to be a bit difficult but is getting better is breakout rooms um, and breakout rooms on the back end can be great if you're putting everybody where they're supposed to be. Um, but, you know, once you get into a larger meeting size, right, 100 plus, 200, um, and you want to do these breakout rooms, great. Everybody can put choose their own room that they can go to. But sometimes someone could be joining off a phone or an iPad or some other device that is not a standard laptop and they can't necessarily find where they're supposed to go or how they get into that breakout room. Um, and that's something that we have run into a few times. So I think breakout rooms are great, but sometimes you do have a little bit of issue when it comes to that. And that would probably be the one thing that hasn't worked out the best, but we're still, we're still getting, I, I think we'll get there. I think what we could definitely figure out the, the, all the hinky stuff with the breakout rooms, but yes. Yeah, um, I, I mean, anytime people are, are shifting around, that's adding an extra layer of 
difficulty. I mean, I know we have also struggled with the timing. Um, and actually one of the best practices here with uh, sharing a run of show, I think could go a, um, a long ways to helping us out a lot of times so people have a general idea of how long they're supposed to talk for. Because I mean, as you said, like cutting off someone who's taken time out of their day to, um, to help us out and to present, um, it's, it's a really challenging thing to do. Um, and, and, so, and I just think go that, ahead. Um, in that instance, um, you know, if you ever find yourself in that situation, a good option to make available to people is, you know, if the speakers are okay with it, making their emails um, available and sharing that out in case, you know, you have to cut the Q&A portion short at the end um, to allow the speakers to present. You can always make their email available so they can follow up with the speaker if there are more questions um, or anything like that. So that is something that you could do. Yeah, that's an excellent solution. So like after, I mean, I generally, and I should have done this before this, but I should have cleared with you all if we can follow up via email if there's any other um, any other concerns or questions after the fact. But that is a, a fantastic way to get around some of these uh, time related issues, especially for the Q and A's, because those seem to get. I mean, I, I, having run a number of these events, the Q and A's seem to be the thing that gets dropped, um, or shortened more than we would like. I think. Um, in a lot of instances. Um, and there's just, I mean, there's nothing we can do about that. But um, I think that is a good alternative solution to that. Sort of as a follow on to that, I mean, you mentioned like some technology issues earlier. Um, do you all recommend like, technology for your uh, speakers to use, like a laptop, a hard line, anything like that? Mm. Um, so I do, I have my, my work laptop. And then I have like a second monitor. Um, and that is always really helpful because I'm usually playing the role of moderator on, on the trainings that we hold. So, and I'm also, you know, looking at the Q&A and, &A and um, talking with my colleagues who are also on that are uh, doing other things or having other roles on the training. So I, I do find it helpful to have the double screen. I know that's not always feasible. Um, sometimes, you know, because- I'll also put my notes on my phone in case I like can't look at my notes on my one screen. Um, so, so there are workarounds or sometimes I'll print some things out, but um, the double screen helps um, in terms of other stuff. I'm not sure if there's anything else I think. That's plenty. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, as far as tech, I think kind of like how Dr. Thomas said, it's not always feasible to have two screens, um, but I know me usually doing stuff on the back end, I try, if there's a lot of materials that I know have to be presented, I have, I think we all have a lot of windows open anyway all the time, um, but I at least have one window specifically with all of the materials for this program or for that meeting or for that uh, webinar, right? So I'm not going back and forth from, oh, I need to go here, oh, I need to go here. They're all in one place. They're usually in order of when they need to be presented, um, just so I don't have to scramble from back and forth. I'm clicking in order. Um, and usually I like to do the most of that stuff on the back end. So the speakers kind of just have to worry about speaking for the most part, right? So um, for them, hopefully it's just, they show up, turn your camera on and have a good day. I, I do know one thing actually that um, this happened to me actually yesterday is that um, our speaker was on, he was on a, his computer and his laptop and he lost power um, for a, uh, um, he was in the middle of a windstorm. However, he did have his cell phone as a backup ready to go. And so I think that is um, potential um, back or a, a potential backup situation in case like your main, like the speaker's main computer crashes like during the event, which technology issues happen. I think having like a secondary option available as Alana said, you can have two computers, one for the slides, one for your, one for your Zoom itself. Um, so then finally, what are you thinking about as we move to planning hybrid events? Like maybe in the future we can have a little in person and then a video um, going on simultaneously. Um, what do you what do you think are the biggest challenges or opportunities um, for that? 
Um, I would say probably challenges with that would, that is when more of a team would need to be involved. I know um, kind of we mentioned a lot of our groups could be smaller organizations. So you probably only have two to three people. Um, but I think once you start doing a hybrid event, you might have to then start looking into, okay, who is going to be the team that's running the virtual portion, right? Because um, I think with that, you want to assure that all participants are remaining safe, whether it's in person, virtual, however, but you also want to maintain the quality of the experience. Um, so you want to make sure that your virtual experience is matching up with your in-person in -person experience as well. So making sure that you have a designated team for that virtual portion, just as you'll have a designated team for the in-person in -person portion, I think will make sure that your event goes off very successfully when it comes to the hybrid um, style of events. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, I think the only thing that I would add is like really the asking, asking the question of like, does it need to be a hybrid event? You know, like um, it's, it's a thing about resources, but then also time, like, you know, doing something virtually is a lot easier for people and it makes it a lot more accessible to people too and and if you have the resources to do something hybrid or in person that's awesome and that's amazing um so so really asking that question of does it need to be hybrid and then also um if that question's yes and and if you can do it in person um just being mindful of like how does each one complement each other so making sure that people aren't doing the same thing in the virtual setting but and the same thing in the hybrid setting, but really like the activities or the content of, of each of those are going to complement um, the, the format of, of that meeting. So that's my only advice there. Thank you. Um, I do know that our own urban events team, and I'm not gonna put them on the spot, but I know they're in the process of developing their own best practices and do, I'm sure thinking about a lot of the same things you all are about how to put on a hybrid event um in this new and constantly changing um COVID environment um with that i think um we're all done with our panel i just want to thank both darshana and ajwa once again um for taking the time to uh, speak with us all today and to share their insights um with that i am going to stop recording so we can um